All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, tonight, we are going to conclude our little study of the Mahatanha Samkhya Sutta, the, uh, the greater discourse on the destruction of craving. So we did this last week and we started it two weeks ago. And I decided I wanted to do one more night on this sutra because in many ways we didn't really actually get to the, the message. Like it was sort of a lot of buildup, but we didn't actually hear in, in a way about the destruction of craving. So tonight we're going to kind of conclude the sutra. Um, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time at the beginning catching us up. Uh, I want to reestablish a few important ideas. Um, yeah, and then we're going to kind of conclude the rest of the sutra. Um, the reason why I wanted to do this particular sutta is not so much actually because of this idea of the destruction of craving, although I think that's very important. But I actually, I wanted to do this sutra because of it's a really interesting sutra on the nature of the mind and consciousness. And this is a topic that we, you know, we talk a, a lot about in Dharma doors. We sort of focus on it in a lot of ways. And this one for me, it was a really, really good teaching on it. And so let me kind of remind you of how this started. So this whole sutra, oh, and by the way, we're, if you weren't here last week or the week before, we're reading from the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses of the Buddha. And we're reading Sutta number 38, which is this greater discourse on the destruction of Tanha, of destruction of craving. And this whole sutra, it all started with a monk named Sati, who, who has a pernicious view he, he holds a wrong view. And once again, just sort of for the record, this monk, this errant monk, what he thinks is, he says that as I understand the Dharma taught by the Buddha, it's this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirths, not a different one. It is this vijnana, this consciousness. And when the Buddha uh, confronts Sati about this pernicious view, Sati further says, yeah, that's what I think. That's, uh, that's what I thought you said. Like, that's what I thought the Dharma was. And he, he elaborates further. And what he says is he says, yeah, that's exactly what I think. Um, as I understand the Dharma, it's this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. And then he adds this idea that it is that which speaks and feels and experiences here and there the results of good and bad actions. So this is Sati's pernicious view that it's this consciousness, this vijnana, that runs and wanders through rebirth, getting reborn and reborn. And it is this vijnana, this consciousness, that later on receives the results of good and bad actions. Now, the reason why, again, the reason why I wanted to focus on this sutra and the re reason why I wanted to read it is that's probably a lot of our views about this, that it is this consciousness that later on, a day from now or a week from now or however long from now, but it's this consciousness that later on receives the results of the bad, good and bad actions of consciousness in that way. And the Buddha dispels this view of sati and says, I have never, ever taught that it's this consciousness that goes on to be reborn. And I've never taught that it's this consciousness that later on receives the results of good and bad actions. The Buddha says, I've always taught 
that vinyana, that consciousness, is dependently originated. And then the Buddha, so that's the first section of the sutta. Uh, they call it the, the setting, but it's the kind of the main idea, the main question. And then there's a section about the conditionality of consciousness. And it's in that section where the Buddha then elaborates, or I should say he explains again what he means by the dependently originated nature of consciousness. Now, I don't want to kind of redo, you know, last week's Dharma talk and the Dharma talk before that, but I do for tonight, I want to reestablish like a very clear understanding of consciousness in Buddhism, in particular, the dependently arising nature of consciousness. So the analogy that I use, and I think I used this last week, but I, I use it all the time. But the analogy that I always use for consciousness is a record and a needle. And the basic idea is that we can think of a record needle like this, you know, again, this is not a real record needle, but for, as a prop, we can think of this as the sensory organ. This could be the eyes, this could be our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body, or even the brain. And then we want to think about the record as either a visible object, or a sound, or a scent, or a flavor, or something to touch, or something to think about. So we've got sensory organ, sensory object. Now, if you know about records and record needles, you know that if the record and the record needle are like, are like this, meaning if they're not touching each other, meaning they're not in contact, if the record and the record needle are this far apart, there's no music. And it's not that there's like music that you just can't hear. It's just there is no music. But if you touch the record needle to the record and there's contact, and of course, in the case of a record, if there's movement, then all of a sudden, out of the record needle, there will start to arise music. Well, in the Buddhist tradition, consciousness is exactly like that, which is that you have a body of form that is a, an amalgamation of sensory organs, a bunch of different types of sensors, a bunch of different type of, types of needles. And there, <laughs> waiting to come into contact with sensory objects. And so, for example, when the ear comes into contact with a sound, there arises auditory consciousness and auditory awareness. But as soon as there's a separation of ear and sound, there's just no more sound. And it's not that the sound has receded back into the object. And it's not that the sound has receded back into the mind. It's just that the conditions for there to be the sound or the conditions for there to be the visual phenomena, the conditions are just no longer there. And so there's just no longer consciousness or there's just no longer music. So Buddhism sees the arising of consciousness and visual awareness, auditory awareness, olfactory awareness, gustatory awareness, tactile awareness. So all six awarenesses or consciousnesses are emergent upon their being contact. No contact, no consciousness. Again, I kind of we need to really reinforce that idea. Now, another really important thing about this is we also want to understand, and I mentioned this last week, that regarding this record needle and this record, 
and they're coming into contact and then the arising of music? Well, the particular quality of the music, like what it sounds like, I know that we like to think that that's entirely this, like that the potential for the way the music will sound, like, you know, is this a rock and roll? Is this jazz? Is this funk and soul? So this particular record, we like to think has the music. And what we like to think is that it's just the needle that like lets the music out. But that's not actually how records and record needles work. And what I mean is, is that depending upon the record needle, the sound is going to be of a particular quality. And so what I'm getting at is, is that the particular music is dependent upon both the form of the record and the form of the needle. Likewise, a visual, if you're having a visual sensation, it's not just that your eyes are just seeing what is there to be seen. No, 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 no. What you're seeing is the product of your eyes coming into contact with that object. And so your visual awareness is kind of uniquely your own in that way. It's a unique version that you're hearing or smelling or tasting or touching or thinking about. And the important thing to notice about that, meaning that the music is both this and this, what that means is, is that if I change either of these, I change the result. So the object I'm looking at could change or my eyes could change. The shape of my eyes could change and all of a sudden it's blurry. And so the final visual product is indeed dependently originating based upon both object and organ. And this is the Buddha's answer to sati about why it is that it can't be this consciousness that later on gets reborn or that later on receives the results of good and bad actions, because that's going to be a different state of consciousness dependent upon those conditions. This is this state of consciousness dependent upon these conditions now. And so what we've been doing for the last couple of weeks, that since we've been looking at the sutra, is that we've been kind of toggling between this sort of Buddhist idea of a present state of arisen consciousness that is like happening here now versus thinking of this idea of me being conscious. And then later on, I'll be conscious of this. And then a couple minutes later, I'll be conscious of this. So yeah, the consciousness is changing, but I'm the thinker. And that's where the Buddha says, ah, 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 not so fast. It's this idea that I'm conscious or I'm thinking versus thinking's happening. Consciousness is arising. Now, that's a quick review of what we talked about in the first two nights of this. But if you, oh, please, no, please. Um, I probably need to hear this every week for the rest of my life. <laughs> but, uh, um, so thank you for that. But I have a question uh in the in the needle uh and record uh scenario you i think interchangeably used the word uh awareness mm. consciousness and and this is the one that i'm confused about music mm. it, it, those those are not all the same thing, are they? I mean, awareness and consciousness, I can see being two different ways to describe that. But 
Yes. I miss something or yep. how? So regarding consciousness and awareness, real quick. So the word is vinyana and normally translated as consciousness. But I like to think of vinyana as like basically a kind of awareness because the eyes are conscious. The, you know, the eyes are visually aware. The ears are conscious. They're auditorily aware. So I use those a little uh, interchangeably. But then the idea of the music. So what I kind of meant by that was if you're kind of with me on this analogy of the record and the needle and the music, then you can kind of think about what you're looking at, you know, is like uh, the, the string section. And there's an arising of the visual awareness, which is the string section. But then what you're hearing is maybe, you know, the, I don't, I don't know my orchestra terms, but a different part of the orchestra. And then what you're smelling is a different part of the orchestra. And what you're tasting is a different part of the orchestra. And what you're in contact with is a different part of the orchestra. <laughs> and then what you're thinking about is a different part of the orchestra. And then you have these six parts of the orchestra that at any given moment, like right now, is a symphony of sensations arising that is everything you are presently in contact with and sensing and feeling, smelling, hearing, and it is giving rise to this. And so you can kind of imagine all of your sensory organs plugged in or in contact with sensory objects, and there is the arising of consciousness now. <laughs> But it's changing with every little adaptation of what you're in contact with. Or if I happen to lose an ear and it's only coming in this ear, that's going to change the symphony or the end result of the music. So that was my music analogy. But so in a way, awareness. You, I think. I think what you're saying is this right? Is that awareness? That the ear is the needle and the you know, sound, sound wave. The, the violin is the record or something. And then, yep, yep. The, 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 then when the the ear consciousness, the ear awareness. No, when the ear meets the violin, awareness arises, and that is music, right? Okay. Yeah, I, I was being a little poetic with my analogy of the music, but yeah, it sounds like no, you were that's, keeping that's up. Good. I'll I'll keep ruminating on that for the next decade or so. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, so again, that's what we covered in the first kind of couple of nights. And again, there's kind of like a toggling that we can do between a kind of, again, present state of arisen conscious awareness or this delusion of me being consciously aware. Now, if everything I said sort of makes sense and you understand what it would mean to be an emergently arisen state of consciousness, if that makes sense, then when you go over to the next section of the sutra, which was called the general questionnaire on being, the Buddha asks all the monks, bhikkhus, do you see that this has come to be? And they all say, yeah. And what they're talking about is, so do you see it that way? The Buddha is asking the monks, asking the bhikkhus. So do you see it that you are presently arisen? Or are you looking at it like, you know, I'm being conscious or I'm conscious of. And so this longer section, the general questioner on being was sort of going through the different ways of understanding being a present state of conscious risen awareness and what that kind of means in that way. So then the idea is, is this, this is where the, the sutra like really starts to kind of get deep in a way. So 
if everything that we just talked about makes sense in that way, in particular, this idea of the the sensors, the the like the needles. <laughs> If it all makes sense that it's these sensors or these needles in contact in that way, then what we're talking about is this kind of dependency. And what I mean is, is that what you are visually aware of right now is dependent upon what you're looking at. What you're hearing is dependent upon what you're listening to. So there's these dependencies and the really important part about this suture and about this teaching that we're going to go deeper into tonight is it's about this idea that if you don't have the thing that this is dependent upon you just no longer have the thing it's just again the conditions are not there for it to be at all in that sense and so that's when the sutra kind of drifted into this discourse about nutriment and this things that the, the body and the being are dependent on. But this was all to bring us to the theme of the sutra, which is tanha, craving. And so this sutra is about cutting off craving. And so the Buddha eventually gets to, ah, this is all resting on craving. And so... We get to this part, and let me just, where did it go? Yeah, so basically this craving, the Buddha asked this question of, well, what is craving dependent upon? And in this paragraph, which is the nutriment and dependent origination section, in answer to this question, but why do, like, what's up with craving? Like, where does craving come from? What is it dependent upon? And the idea is that craving has ved vedana, sensations, as its dependency. And the idea here is, is, and this is, it's subtle, but I really, you know, we need to really think about this. It's about the nature of craving. And what we need to think about is, is this, let's, let's use an, I haven't, I'm going to use a different example. Let's use this example. So in some country that you've never been to, they have a, they have a, a dish, they have a food that you've never tasted. Do you wake up in the middle of the night craving that food? Can you like just not rest until you've had that? Oh, that's right. You probably don't have the slightest bit of craving for that which you have never had a sensation of. If you've never had a taste of this food, could you be craving and desirous for it? It, it just doesn't make any sense. In, in, in many ways, it's it would be impossible. And, you know, right now, I've told you that there's a country and I've told you that there's a food involved. So you actually right now have a little bit to go on to develop, uh, like you, maybe you don't even like food. <laughs> and so you're like, no, nah, I don't want it. I don't care what it is. I have, don't have craving for it. But I'm talking about like before I even mentioned my example. So before I even mentioned anything, how did you feel about that? <laughs> did you crave that? Crave what? Exactly. Because you hadn't had the taste yet, you can't crave it. And so this is, and I know this seems like, duh, but we actually need to think about this. All of our cravings, all of our desires, all of our addictions, all of our, all of that. It's only for things that we have had a taste of in that way. The and in particular, of course, if you understand the nature of Vedana, this Buddhist idea of feelings or sensations, 
you know where what we're really talking about is having a positive or negative sensation or reaction to things. And so we develop a kind of, ooh, I like that, or ooh, get that away. And only after we have had the initial, ooh, I like that, that tastes good. Now that's a potential thing to crave. But again, no sensation, no Vedana. Where's room for craving? There's no craving. Okay, where does sensations come from? What is the necessary dependency for having sensations? Well, if we read through, it's contact, coming into contact with that food. And then the question is, well, then where does contact arise from? Well, contact arises from the sixfold sense bases, the six record needles that we were talking about, the six sensors. And then the idea is, well, where do those six senses come from? What's the, the foundation for having those six senses? And the sixfold base has nama rupa as its foundation, name and form. Now, that one's a kind of a tricky one, and I'm not going to risk a whole night of Dharma talk about Nama Rupa again. But there's a lot of different ways to understand Nama Rupa, but effectively, it's kind of the language game in terms of having a kind of linguistic structure to think in and to think in, a, in according to. And then the question becomes, well, that Nama Rupa language game that is then sensing sights and sounds and flavors and tactile objects and differentiating those types of sensory objects, what does the language game or nama rupa depend upon? Well, it depends upon a vinyana, a consciousness to play the language game. If there's no consciousness playing the language game, then there's no language game. And if there's no language game, then there's no division into six sense organs or six sense contacts. And then there's no contact. And then there's no sensation. And then there's no craving. Well, what is this vinyana or this consciousness dependent upon? And what consciousness or vijnana is ultimately dependent upon is something in Buddhism that they call samskara, which can be translated as habits, habit energy, conditioning, conditioned formations, con volitional formations. Samskara has a million translations. But what we want to think about it as is habits, conditioning in the kind of B.F. Skinner behavioral conditioning kind of a way. Now, I'm going to talk about con or samskara and its relationship to consciousness. I'm going to talk deeper about that in a second. But just really quickly, where is the conditioning? Where is the samskara? What is that dependent upon? And that's where we get to the kind of the bottom of this, which is that those habitual formations or the habit energy is dependent upon ignorance. It has ignorance as its source. Now, what we just did there is that we went from craving to what it is dependent upon, to what it's dependent upon, to what it's dependent upon. And we went kind of down, if you will. And we went all the way down to the, the bottom, ignorance. Now, I want to say a quick thing about samskara and in particular, its relationship to consciousness. So a good example of samskara, and, and I think it's one of the most, one of the most interesting examples of samskara. One of the wildest forms of samskara is learning to speak and basically learning language and learning to read or speak. And what I mean is, is that, do you think 
a baby that doesn't know how to speak language, do you think they're sitting around thinking about great literature? Do you think that they're sitting there with an internal dialogue about what they want to eat? Or is a baby just hungry in that way? And what I mean is, is that, grab my uh, prop here. When you are a baby and I show you that, the baby's like, ah, just, you know, but if it's a toddler or, you know, a younger person and I start saying, a, a, and the mind starts to become conditioned. Oh, you mean that shape is, per you can, it has, it's associated with a sound. Oh, and it, it's even a word. And you eventually learn to read, you learn to speak, you learn words, you learn language, but you are conditioning the mental faculty. And it becomes to the point where you no longer need to like, wait, what, what, what was that one called again? Oh no, no, eventually you just read fluidly across a page. Actually, you just speak and you don't have to sit there going like, what's, what's the word for this again? What's the word for this again? What's no, you, you're conditioned. It just flows naturally in that way. But my point is, again, is, is that your vinyana, your consciousness, what you are conscious of is entirely dependent upon the way the mind has been conditioned. So samskara is the foundation of consciousness. No habituation, no conditioning, no consciousness in that way. And then again, well, where's the habit? Where are the habits coming from? Where is that conditioning coming from? Not understanding. Ignorance. Now, at this point, if it's still not entirely clear what's going on here, the sutra is far from over. All we need at this point, all we need to be thinking about is, huh, that does seem sort of right, that these things are related and dependent in that sense. And we really want to have that super clear understanding that, for example, let's go back a few. We want to have that really clear understanding that I cannot crave what I've never been in contact with. That it's just utterly impossible for there to be that at all. So that's the kind of main way that we are kind of being trained to think here. Know that, there's just no that. So now I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to what is called the forward exposition upon arising. And now if everything that I said is understandable, I'm not going to I presume it all makes perfect sense, but just all the words I've said have kind of made sense. The Buddha starts again and says, so, so bhikkhus, with avidya, with ignorance as condition, habitual habit energy comes to be. With these habits, with this samskara, with this conditioning as a condition, Consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as a condition, nama rupa, language, thinking comes to be in that way. With nama rupa as a condition, the sixfold sense base comes to be. With the sixfold sense base as condition, contact comes to be. With contact as a condition, feeling or sensations come to be. With feeling or sensations as a condition, craving comes to be. With craving as a condition, 
clinging comes to be. We only cling and become attached to that which we love, desire, and crave. If it's something that I really don't like, I do not get attached to it in that way. It's only those desirous things in that way. Clinging, what does clinging have as its condition? Clinging has as its condition being, bahava, or gives rise to, I apologize, I flipped that. Clinging gives rise to bahava, being. Now, this one we haven't talked about yet. But that being, bahava, that as a condition, birth comes to be. With birth as a condition, aging and death comes to be. And with aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. And such bhikkhus is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. So in that section, the Buddha begins at the bottom with ignorance and shows you the buildup of this whole mass of suffering. Now, really quickly, because we didn't talk about it, we haven't talked about it this session or the last few sessions, that idea that clinging like upadana, right? Being attached. Well, let's remember, where does that come from? Like, why would we be attached? All right, craving. Craving can lead to and is the necessary condition for attachment. And then there's this idea that that clinging or that attachment is what gives rise to bahava. And this is probably... This is a very tricky idea, and it's not tricky the way Nama Rupa is tricky. Nama Rupa is tricky because it's like, it's kind of a deeply philosophical idea, and it's like so close to the nature of consciousness itself that it's kind of hard to think about. But Bhava is not hard, or it's not tricky for that reason. Bhava is tricky to define or tricky to translate because of Buddhism. And what I mean by that is, is that in the earliest forms of Buddhism and like the Hinayana, Bhava, it kind of meant conception, like the conception event and the conception, like conceiving a baby. <laughs> And the conception event is what was necessary for there to be the birth of a baby. Because if there was no birth, I mean, sorry, if there was no conception, you don't, there's no baby. Now that's in the early form of Buddhism where Bahava was considered the, basically like, again, the conception of the embryo. And the idea here is, is that you do not get the conception of an embryo unless there is desire to do that. And this has to do with coitus. This has to do with um, like even finding a sperm donor, finding an egg donor, putting them together and kind of, you know, kind of having a baby that way. In order for somebody to go find a sperm donor and an egg donor, they need to want to do that. That's not just going to kind of accidentally happen. There is craving and attachment that is behind conception. And again, I want to remind you, I'm giving you like the early Buddhist version of this. And what we need to understand again is that if there's no conception event, there's just no birth. You just can't have a baby be born if it hasn't been conceived. And then guess what? If there's no birth, there's no death. Because that which has not been born can never die. And from birth, we get death. And death is the condition or the basis 
for lamentation, sorrow, pain, grief, and despair, this whole mass of suffering. But, bhikkhus, with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of samskara, of the habitual conditioned behaviors. No ignorance, no more ignorant conditioning. With the cessation of our habitual conditioned behaviors, there is the cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, there is the cessation of nama rupa, name and form. With the cessation of name and form, there is the cessation of the sixfold sense space. With the cessation of the sixfold sense space, there is the cessation of contact. You just can't have it anymore. With the cessation of contact, the cessation of feeling or sensations. With the cessation of sensations, there is the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving, there is the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, there is the cessation of bahava, of being. And with the cessation of being, there is the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, there is the cessation of aging and death sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. These all cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. <clears throat> all right. So this is the classic way, by the way, of course, that you study this 12-link chain of dependent origination. You study it by going this way, kind of down the stack in terms of what's this dependent upon? What's this dependent upon? Then you go up the stack in terms of, well, because of this, there's this. And because of this, there's this. And you go all the way up. And then you go back down. And then you go back up. And the point of this is that this is not just a piece of information that you need to have heard. These are ideas that you need to think about and probably think about them again, and probably think about them again, and think about them in a different order. And there's a way in which we've been so conditioned to think a certain way, we need to kind of undo that by thinking this way a few times. And by the way, as far as I understand it from the language of Buddhism, that this type of returning to these teachings in different ways backwards and forwards, this is what I understand as turning the Dharma wheel. It's this Buddhist approach to kind of understanding things and coming back to them and coming back to them. They call it turning the Dharma wheel in that way. All right. So let's do this. So any questions, comments about any of this so far? I mean, you know, we've already had a few good questions, but everybody doing okay? Cool. So we've reached the point, by the way, where we've 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 reached like the the uh, the big message of the sutra, which is bringing this whole mass of suffering including, of course, tanha, the craving, we've just been told how to bring it all to cessation, how to make it all disappear. You need to get rid of the dependencies. Now, the interesting thing about the 12-link chain of dependent origination is that if you could successfully remove any one of these 12 links, there is no place for the other 11. The whole house of cards of this falls apart. And you really could jump in anywhere. And if you really looked at it and really understood if there was no, for example, contact, the whole house of cards would fall apart. Just that one link, contact. 
Now, from that point of view, and I, I chose that one kind of randomly, by the way, just, just chose one. But because I chose it, let me go a little further on it, just as an example. In, in fact, the, the early Buddhist tradition, which was much more focused on like deep states of meditation, the early form of Buddhism was actually very interested in eliminating contact as a method for bringing the whole mass of suffering to cessation. And so in the early Buddhist tradition, they were really big on sensory deprivation, closing the eyes, closing the ears, closing the nose, closing the mouth, effectively closing off the body, and eventually bringing the mind to a state of stillness so that basically all of the sensors all of the needles were removed from contact with sensory objects. And that would bring a state of what is known as nirodha, complete cessation, total stillness. You're not seeing anything. You're not hearing, smelling, tasting, touching anything. And deprived of external sense media, the mind will spin around for a while, just sort of on memories, just kind of regurgitating memories and ideas. But eventually, you can bring that stirring mind and remove its contact from the ideas. And then that is, again, nirodha, this total cessation. And basically, from an early Buddhist point of view, that took the entire thing offline. And because it was offline, you were not reinforcing condition delusional behavior, your samskara. You couldn't be conscious of anything because you weren't reinforcing your conditioned behavior and you weren't in contact with anything, so you can't be conscious. So you really can't have any of the rest of the 12 link chain of causation just by removing contact. Now, it gets a little tricky, of course, when you come back online in that sense, but there's sort of early Buddhist ideas for what it means to clear out all the samskara. And in the early Buddhist tradition, the only way to really clear out all the samskara was to go to that, uh, basically to unplug the machine <laughs> and then plug it back in like a computer in that way and kind of wipe the memory drive. That was the older Buddhist version for eliminating a lot of this, was a kind of sensory deprivation and certainly a kind of deprivation from society and, you know, things like that. All right, so that's just, again, I just chose one example of contact, but kind of tried to show you how the whole mass of suffering has nowhere to be if there's not contact in that way. All right, so let's do this. Let me check my notes. Well, so I'm not going to go through all of these, but I do want you to know that the sutra keeps going kind of up and down, backwards and forwards through all of these 12 links. And again, what we're focusing on is these kind of removing parts of it to show you or to show us how the dependencies disappear in that way. So let's get to the kind of the good part or let's kind of get towards the end. Ah, uh, I, I, will, I will say one, I do wanna add one other thing though. In this sutra, I think it's in section 19, if you happen to have this version on page 355, the Buddha introduces an important phrase. And what it is, is he says, when this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. <laughs> and that is the simplest kind of explanation of dependent origination that the Buddha ever gives that when there's this, there's that. Or when there is this arises, that arises. Now, 
this is sort of a very general expression. And the idea, of course, is that what this is could be contact, could be sensation, it could be the sixth sense basis, it could be whatever, but it's understanding that when there this arises, that arises. But there's also this kind of deeper understanding of dependent origination in there. And it's this idea that if you have this, you automatically have that, which is to say, not this, <clears throat> immediately. And notice that it's not that I declare there to be this, and then like a few minutes later, there's a that. The very moment this is declared, you have declared that, meaning you have created the category that by absolute necessity, because <clears throat> you don't ever, ever, ever get to have a this without a that. In the exact same way that you don't ever get to have a here without a there. If you make a here, you make a there. <clears throat> and it this is a matter of kind of language and differentiation and all of that. But it's really kind of an, a, it's at the heart of dependent origination, which is the simultaneous arising of this and that. The simultaneous arising of here and there. The simultaneous arising of these 12 link chain of dependent origination. And what I mean by that is that although the Buddha presents this as ignorance giving rise to con to ignorance giving rise to samskara which gives rise to consciousness which gives rise to nama rupa which gives rise to the six sense bases which gives rise to that even though the buddha presents it in this way we need to understand it as if you have one of them you have all of them and if you don't have any one of them you don't have any of them so the 12 link chain is a package deal in that way. And you can notice this because of this. Again, you don't ever get a birth that isn't followed or included by a death. It's, it doesn't make any sense in that way. So that is sort of the, <clears throat> excuse me, that goes back to that section 17. But then again, in section 18, <clears throat> 19, 20, 21, and 22, the Buddha goes through all of the 12 links, up and down, up and down. So given all of that, let's get to section 23, because this is where the Buddha basically finally returns to the monk Sati who had the pernicious view. Now, our minds are not entirely primed for this because I didn't walk us through all of the turnings of the wheel, but the Buddha says, so bhikkhus, knowing and seeing this way, would you run back to the past thus would you wonder and think, were we in the past? Were we not in the past? What were we in the past? How were we in the past? Having been what? What did we become in the past? And the bhikkhus replied, no, venerable sir. Knowing and seeing this way, would you run forward to the future? And think thus, shall we be in the future? Shall we not be in the future? What shall we be in the future? How shall we be in the future? Having been what, what shall be, we become in the future? And the bhikkhus replied, no, venerable sir, we, we wouldn't think that way. 
And the Buddha once again says, knowing and seeing in this way, bhikkhus, would you now be inwardly perplexed about the present thus? Thinking, am I? <laughs> am I not? What am I? How am I? Where has this being come from? Where will it go? And the bhikkhus replied, no, venerable sir. All right, so let's walk through that. So that, again, is sort of the Buddha's conclusion where he responds to sati in that way. Because remember, sati believed that this consciousness is the one that later on would receive the results of good and bad action and would eventually be reborn in a future. But given what we've just talked about in terms of dependent arising, the kind of, again, the, the orchestra of sensations that are giving rise to this conscious state of awareness that might be confused that it's the one doing it rather than being it. But the idea is, is that if you really understand this idea of a present state of arisen consciousness, would you look into the back, into the past and, and wonder, was I, was I not? What was I? The idea would be that you would not do that because you would be aware that there isn't this back there at all. At all. How about the future? And by the way, when, when the Buddha says this thing about, um, and so bhikkhus, knowing and seeing in the way that we've just talked about, would you run forward to the future and wonder, shall I be in the future? Shall I not be in the future? What shall I be in the future? How shall I be in the future? What the Buddha is talking about there is, given what we just said, is, is there any basis for wondering about Will, you know, am I going to be around next week? Like meaning worrying about dying and worrying like, oh, am I going to make it to next year? The Buddha is asking the bhikkhus, does it make any sense to worry about that? If that's not your, this consciousness. And that's where they're all responding. No, we're all on one. That we, that we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't look to the past for the self in that way. We wouldn't look to the future. And then the Buddha concludes with this present as well, wondering, am I, am I not, <laughs> what am I? A bhikkhu understands this dependently arisen state of consciousness and is not identifying with the five aggregates of the body of form. That's part of the idea. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about that. <laughs> All right. Now, oh, no, we. There we go. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, you're right. It's just mind blowing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My but, pleasure. But, but because <laughs> I'm caught up in all of this. I am planning for the future. I am planning for tomorrow. I, at least I'm hoping <laughs> as I as I like to practice every morning I wake up and go, oh, <laughs> made it. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes when I bring it up to my uh, to other people, well that, let's not even do that. Sometimes I feel like am I am I insanely naive and stupid? Or am I on track? Mm. I tend to think I'm right on track. You know, mm. uh, the rituals, the chanting, the prayers, the sitting. No, just mm. just be here. And if I can be here right now, then I'm okay. But then this other little voice in my voice, or yeah, the, the, that that conditioning of like, oh, you're just crazy. Oh, that's crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in there. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Noe. <clears throat> By the way, Noe's comment 
um, reminded me of something that I wanted to mention. I want to make something clear, or actually it's not about making it clear, is I want us to think about something. So I want us to think about like, because I, I understand, and it's not what Noe said, actually. Noe, what Noe said is totally in line with what we're talking about. But what Noe said did make me think about a possible um, concern. And it would be a concern about, oh, different kinds of like responsibility or what we might think of as responsibility or things like that in terms of like a kind of responsibility that we have to think about the future to plan, to prepare, things like that, and a sort of value to the past, learning from our mistakes and things like that. And so I know that there could be a possible concern for an irresponsibility in this, but allow me to kind of point something out. So let me, let me try to actually grab a good example. <clears throat> So let's say, <clears throat> let's say you had a garden and let's say in the garden, or actually no, better yet, if it's not your garden, let's say that you go out into the woods or what have you, and you brush up against a plant and you get um, a reaction, you get, you know, hives or, or, you know, something like that, right? So the idea here is, is that now you have put it together that that plant coming into contact will give me this itching. And so learning <laughs> means if I don't want to be itchy, I should not come into contact with that plant, right? But what I want us to think about is this. After that initial contact with the plant, where I've learned this knowledge now that it gives hives and I shouldn't come into contact with it? Am I walking around all the time thinking about that plant all the time, just waiting for it to come into contact with me, worrying about it coming into contact with me all the time? Or is it that upon the next time I see that plant, <laughs> I'm aware of what it will cause? And that happens in the present moment and notice, I don't need to be carrying around that knowledge all the time in the present of my mind. I've done the learning. The learning is back there. I can put the past to rest. I can access it. It will be there. But I don't need to obsess about it. Likewise, regarding the future... <laughs> The idea here is, is I, I know that a lot of us like to plan for the future and to create ideas of the future. And there's, of course, a certain degree of social responsibility up to that, of course, if we're householders. But of course, what we know is the future's untold. Anything could happen. And so if I make a plan to do something, do you think it's wise for me to keep obsessing about that plan all the time moving into the future? Or do I make the plan, put it to rest, and then in the future, if the conditions are there, I will do that. But if the conditions have changed, I haven't been rigidly holding on to that as what the outcome is going to be the whole time. And so I can more easily adapt to the reality of the situation. My point is, is there's different ways of relating to the past and the future. And I'm hoping to right now kind of show how this idea of the me obsessing and worrying about my past and obsessing and worrying about my future, I'm kind of wanting to show how all of that is just anxiety, stress, worry, dukkha, and that in in a certain way, there is no risk to putting the past at rest. And there's no real risk in, well, not being locked into that being the future 
In fact, you're delusional if you're locked into that being the future and you'd be much better off being ready for whatever's going to happen in the future in that way. If you see what I'm saying. So I just want to point out the way that like learning and knowledge can continue in the in this, even though we're dropping this, um, what would be considered the sentient subject in that way. All right, I know that was maybe a little off there, but I just wanted to get that in there. Everybody okay with that idea of, of it responsibly being in the present moment in that sense? Cool. Okay. So since we have the time, um, actually, yeah, since we have the time, let me walk us through the end of this. So I do want you to know that, you know, I study, um, I study a lot of sutras. I love to teach the sutras. I study a lot of sutras. And this sutra, it kind of has a very hard break at the end of verse 25 or paragraph 25. And if you were to ask me as like a scholar, I suspect that uh, chapter or paragraph 26 through the end is kind of an addition because you find this information in other sutras and it kind of seems tacked on to the end of this. But since we might not have ever heard it, uh, let me share it with you. So I, I mentioned earlier about bhava, the conception event, and that if you don't have the conception event, you don't have a birth. Well, the reason why I was sticking to that early Buddhist version of bhava, that it means conception, is because I figured I would have time to read this. So this is the early Buddhist understanding of how reincarnation and rebirth happens. The Buddha says, bhikkhus, the descent of the embryo takes place through the union of three things. Here, meaning in this case, there is the union of the mother and the father. But what if the mother is not in season, meaning she's not ovulating in that way, and the Gandharava or the Gandhava, Gandhava or in Sanskrit, Gandharava, and the Gandharava is not present. In this case, no descent of an embryo takes place. Now, what you need to know before I kind of read the end of this is in the early form of Buddhism, they understood there to be three components to a conception event. There is the mother who has the egg. There is the father who has semen. But there's a third element in the Buddhist tradition, and that's this Gandharava. And if you read Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnote about the Gandharava, nobody's really sure about these Gandharavas. Interestingly, the term Gandharava means a incense eater. <laughs> Don't know why, they, or, you know, there's reasons why they might be called that. But in general, the Buddhist understanding is, is that the Gand, what is being called this Gandharava as far as I've read and done my research on this, that Gandharava is the vin vin vinyanic consciousness of the being that had died. And when a being dies in the early Buddhist tradition, the body of form, the, the physical body of material form, disintegrates and becomes fodder and food for flowers sensations cease because there are no more sensory organs to have those sensory experiences. Perception, the third skanda, perception ceases because there is no longer any organs perceiving anything. In some Buddhist traditions, samskara ceases and Vijnana, your present state of conscious awareness right now, becomes disembodied because it doesn't have a body anymore. 
And it's that vin vinyana that is now basically traversing what will eventually become known as a bardo, the bardo, this gap between lives. And that vinyana is kind of cruising on an ethereal wave. And that becomes known when it's a disembodied waveform consciousness is a Gandharava. And that Gandharava is what goes into the mother's womb, meeting the egg and the semen. And this sutra right now is talking about how all three of those components need to be proper in order for there to be a baby. And that's why it says here that, so let's say that there's the union of the mother and the father, but the mother's not in season and the Gandharava is not present. In this case, no descent of an embryo takes place. But let's say that there is the union of mother and father and the mother is in season, but the Gandharava is not present. In this case, too, there's no descent of the embryo that takes place. But when there is the union of the mother and the father and the mother's in, the se in season and the Gandharava is present, through the union of these three things, the descent of an embryo takes place. The mother then carries the embryo in her womb for nine or ten months with much anxiety as a heavy burden. Then at the end of ninth, nine or ten months, the mother gives birth with much anxiety as a heavy burden. Then when the child is born, she nourishes it with her own blood, for the mother's breast milk is called blood in the noble one's dis discipline. Growing up, their faculties mature, and the child plays at such games as toy plows or tip cat or plays somersaults or plays with toy windmills or toy cars or toy bow bows and arrows. When they grow up and their faculties mature still further, the youth enjoys themselves with the five sensual pleasures, enjoys forms cognizable to the eye, enjoys sounds cognizable to the ear, enjoys odors, flavors, tactile objects, uh, uh, tactile objects that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. On seeing a form with the eye, they lust after it if it is pleasing. They dislike it if it is not pleasing. They abide with mindfulness of the body, unestablished. <laughs> They're all over the place. With a limited mind, they do not understand as it actually is the deliverance of the mind and deliverance by wisdom wherein those evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. Engaged as they are in favoring and opposing things, whatever feeling they feel, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant, they delight in that feeling. They welcome it and remain holding it. As they do so, delight arises. Now delight in feelings becomes clinging. With clinging as a condition, bhava comes to be. With bhava as a condition, birth. With birth as a condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. But I'm not going to go all through the end because it kind of repeats the whole sutra. But that's kind of the quick Buddhist version of how we get trapped in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, and samsara. And it just keeps going around and around and around. Um, but I did want to give plenty of uh, room for questions. Any questions about that kind of basic? Yeah, Maria. Um. So I kind of have a number of thoughts um, going back to this round and round and back and forth. Um, 
So with some of that, when we were talking about the 12 link chain of causation, the turning of the wheel is in some sense um, a clearing out of the samskaras kind of, is that what, because when you were talking about it, it made me think um, of coming back to this, like sometimes there's this image or analogy of the path as sort of coming back around to the same place over and over again. And then you were talking about going back, coming around and it's like the wheel. And it made me think of, I've been reading Dogen again about the, he talks about it as like the circle of the way or the circle of the path, I think. Um, how it's sort of like a clearing out of some scars or conditioning to come back to this place of like our original face or our Buddha nature. Um, so I don't know. So those thoughts were kind of cruising around. Um, and then I was thinking about this thing with the language and how the language game um, and um, I was just reading something about this whole, you were talking about how the Chinese characters, it's so hard to translate because there's so many layers and nuances there that are hard to translate into English. Um, and so that's another way of sort of like, um, using language to break us out of, because there's so many like intuitive nuances to break us out of these concepts and these ideas that sort of language imposes onto things. Um, and so again, using language to, you know, um, get us, you know, um, He's fighting fire with fire, maybe is the best way to put it. So, anyways, just a lot there. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot there. Really quickly, regarding the language game as it pertains to Nama Rupa. So, Maria, and I'm not I'm not picking on you. I would never pick on anybody. I'm just want to take a, a bit of language that you used. The, you use this phrase, you mentioned this idea about the, uh, I forget how you started it, but it was about language imposing on things. And what we actually want to think about is, <clears throat> if you don't have language, what things? And what I mean is, so we have this English word and we call it a, a tree. And in Chinese, they might call it a mu. And in Spanish, they might call it an arbol. All right. What's being called a tree and an arbol and mu? What, what's being called that? And right now you're probably thinking, well, the tree but you don't get to have the that word yet. And notice the question is, okay, what's being called that? Now, in Western philosophy, they are still searching for what language refers to. In the Buddhist tradition, they realize, oh, it's just language. And basically this is like a, a backdoor to emptiness in that sense. So I just wanted us to notice that language is not being imposed on anything. Language is the thing. Yeah, Marie. <laughs> right. And um, this brings me back to the conversation that we were having around this um, about if we don't have, and this is kind of what I was thinking about, we don't have the word we can't we can't think about it and about so <laughs> we were talking about right the 
the the sort of progression of the you know three turnings mm -hmm. of the wheel and how the um the upaya around that or whether or not the buddha i mean obviously anyways um, there had to be the scaffolding in place before we could get to the, you know, the Mahayana teachings, which kind of tore the scaffolding down once we got there. Um, but we couldn't get there until we had the, the language for it. So um, that's kind of what I was talking about. So I have one last bit to add. Thank you, Maria, for all of that, by the way. So based on what Maria said, I have just one last thing to mention. <clears throat> so there's this beautiful word, and it's a beautiful word used in the Buddhist tradition. And it's this word, at least in Sanskrit, amrita. Now, amrita is a very interesting word and the root of it is rita. And rita is like, well, I won't go too deep into what rita is because I'll be here too long, but amrita means deathless. And, but what's really interesting about amrita is that that word, the Sanskrit word amrita, is where the Greek word ambrosia comes from, the elixir of immortality. So in the Greek culture, they have a mythological elixir of immortality. That is it, this beautiful English word, ambrosia. But that word, that beautiful word, ambrosia, is actually from this Sanskrit word, amrita, which is a Buddhist word meaning deathless. And the Buddha dispenses the elixir of immortality. And the Buddha, Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, are described as the teachings on the deathless, on Amrita. And what I often like to point out is Buddhism, of course, is not talking about immortality. Buddhism is not talking about living and being forever because of everything we just talked about. Sati, right? There is no future you, past you in that way. Oh, but what there is, though, is the deathless. But how would you arrive at that elixir of immortality, that ambrosia of deathlessness? How could you achieve that? Well... Having studied our 12-link chain of dependent origination this evening, you might recognize that the necessary dependence for death is birth. And so if you don't have birth, remember, right, if there was no birth event, <clears throat> there could be no death event, right? Well, check this out. It's so simple. One way to think, which is a deluded way, but it's the way that is the default mode, we tend to think that I am this and I was born X number of years ago. But that's what Sati thinks. He thinks that this state of consciousness is what was born, you know, 50 years ago. But if you're not deluded like sati and you understand this dependent origination, in particular, you understand this present state of arisen conscious awareness that is, this was not born ever and certainly not born any time in the past. And you know what the great news is about not being born? You don't die. And that is the teaching of the deathless right there which is that there's this way of thinking, which is thinking of oneself as a birthed being. And then what comes along with that is age, <laughs> decay, and the fear of dying. But if you understand that you are not that which was born X number of years ago, 
that gets you off the hook of being that which dies X number of years from now. The choice is yours in that way. Be present and free or be clinging and attached and be suffering. That's sort of the Dharma there. So I'm gonna end, end it with that one unless there's less questions, comments, answers, or ideas. Cool. Awesome. And by the way, that teaching I just gave you on the death list goes for Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana. That is across the board, the teaching of Anupatika, birthlessness or deathlessness. So, All right. I think that will conclude this greater discourse on the destruction of Tanha. And so we'll get a new sutra next week. Thanks, Noe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it so much. Really do.